Well, the Bible does not teach that the earth is flat nor on pillars, at least literally. This is a good example. It's a little belaboring the point. We've done several YouTubes on this already. It's just a matter of how to approach things linguistically, looking at the words. Words can mean a number of things. Go open up any dictionary, Greek, Hebrew, English. And you say, which meaning of the word you see in the dictionary, which just reflects how words are used, is best applicable? And the answer is to determine three things about the verse and within its own uh, area of the Bible. First thing to determine is context. The second thing to determine is context. Third thing to de determine is context. So... Do we have a global conspiracy here? Psalm 103, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath God, he removed our transgressions from us. A minor point on this verse, it is sometimes alleged that this indicates the flat earth. For on a globe, east does not meet west. The Hebrew terms here, Mazrach and Marab, are equivalent to saying the rising and the setting, so that it is essentially like our sunrise and sunset. Actually, the sun doesn't set and sunrise according to uh, perspective from outside of the universe, in, looking in, or outside of our solar system, looking in. Nevertheless, we say sunrise and sunset even on television weather station programs. Obviously, we still use this sort of phenomenological language today. So this language that describes a phenomena we see from the Earth so that we can understand what's actually going on. So this verse can hardly be criticized on the same basis. Even so, it is a bit tricky to assert that abstract concepts like east and west are like physical objects that can meet around a globe and come to a grinding halt. One would suggest that they could proceed around the globe infinitely since they have nothing to do to nothing to run into. As a side note, we should consider the, the verse previous to this one. Always look within the context of which a verse is located. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy, God's mercy toward them that fear him. So then this reckons as a parallel to the next verse. And since the idea of the psalmist is putting across is that God's mercy and forgiveness are infinite, this seems to argue for, for an infinite distance around the earth, which would work either on a globe or on a flat earth. After all, east and west don't stop at the edge either. And for an infinitely high sky, we might add as we proceed to, finally, we note this passage, Matthew 4, 8. Again, the devil taketh up into an exceeding high mountain and sheweth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. This verse in Matthew by no means implies a flat earth, nor a monstrous mountain large enough to oversee the earth. Indeed, I have always thought that the trip to the mountain was a cheap physiological, psychological ploy by Satan. Indeed, given that what we know of the honor and shame dialectic of that social world, it fits as the premise of an honor challenge by placing Jesus in a preeminent position, and that the showing of the kingdoms was accomplished by means of projecting images of some sort as on a computer screen. Indeed, this is suggested by the parallel verse in Luke 4, 5, which reads, The devil led him to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. Notice that the power and capacity of the devil. So it better stay on God's side. So if you're not on God's side you're, and, and you're against the devil, you're in big trouble. However, as anyone who has climbed mountains knows, and the writer of Matthew surely knew, if he lived in the area around Judea, as Matthew did, the higher up you go, the smaller things down below get, and by your perspective. So it seems unlikely that, even if he did believe in it in a flat earth, Personally, Matthew's offerings is not compatible with a globe. Note that even a, a flat earth, a high mountain, would be a very poor place to observe the kingdoms of the world in their glory. This is a poetic, supernatural point of view of vision. Furthermore, if Matthew was implying that a mountain existed from which all the world was visible, then obviously the mountain would be visible from all parts of the world, and Matthew's reader would roll over laughing and throw his book in the garbage. It is ludicrous to suggest that Matthew believes such a mountain existed. We're talking figuratively here. The mountain in question was probably Mount Quarantania, 
not far from the site where John probably baptized. It commands an incredible view of the Jordan Valley. And those who further wonder who gave this account seem to forget that Jesus was perfectly capable of doing so after the fact to his disciples. Matthew 24, 30 says, And then he shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of earth, heaven with power and great glory. And Revelation 1, 7 that has to be figurative, because there is no spot on the earth that you can look at the uh, from the, that vantage point, and all the tribes of the earth can see the Son of Man coming in the clouds from the north to the south pole and everywhere in between. There's some supernatural thing going on. So Revelation 1, 7, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Sky High Club. Now there are a few verses, some say, indicate a close by sky or a hardened dome in other ways than we have seen. Revelation 6.13, And the stars of heaven fell down into the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. That's poetic, it's not literal. Matthew 24.29, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. In each case above, it is said that the indication of stars falling to earth suggests a close sky with stars hung from it. But this fails to account for the fact that the Greek word here, aster, was used to refer to any object with the appearance of a star, including meteors, an and anachronism, which we preserve today in the expression shooting star. I wonder what kind of gun the shooting star has. It's poetic. It's figurative, it's not literal. At the same time, it is reckoned here and elsewhere that referring to the heavens as being shaken indicates a solid dome. But look at the Greek. Now, the Greek word there is salio, salio, to waver, to agitate, rock, topple, destroy, figuratively to disturb, incitation, move, shake. They have a number of meanings, and you fit that meaning to the appropriate context of what you're looking at. This word is used of physical objects being shaken, but it is also used of intangible objects. Look at 2126 of Luke, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And Acts 2.25, For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the law, always the Lord, always before my face, for he is on my right hand, and that I should not be moved. And 2 Thess 2.2, 2, That he, ye, be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is in hand. So it is quite possible to read this view in Revelation in terms of disturbed, rather than shaken in a physical sense. Context, context, context. There are also a few verses in the Old Testament that are used for this. Second Samuel 2.28 says, Then the earth shook and trembled, the foundations of heaven moved and shook, because he was wroth. Sounds pretty bad until you read the verse following. There went up a smoke out of his nostrils and fire out of his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed, bowed the heavens also and came down and darkness was under his feet. And he rode upon a cherub and did fly. And he was seen upon the wings of the wind. And so on. Quite poetic, obviously far from literal. Joel 2.10 says, The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. But the Hebrew word here is important. In the Hebrew, rahash, is a primary root, to undulate as the earth the sky, also a field of grain, part, participle through fear, and, and to spring as a locust, and to make afraid, make quake, make to shake, make to, to all kinds of options you have. What do you fit it to? The context. Note the field of grain reference. This is a sort of word that might be used to describe a visual phenomenon like the northern lights. It does not necessarily indicate a shaking, solid dome. That's your conclusion. As an editor, you're not to be an editor, you're supposed to be a reader. Finally, Isaiah 13, 13 says, Therefore I will shake the heavens and the earth shall remove out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of our hosts and in the day of his fierce anger. But this is yet another Hebrew word without physical connotations. So it's interpretive translation. Some of these translations, you, when you get to a passage like this, you should read five or six or seven. I do.
to find out what we're talking about and then read somebody's commentary I trust and get the picture. It's studying to show yourself approved. The reference then in line with God's reference wrath is more likely to refer to an inspiration of fear than a literal shaking of what is supposedly a solid dome. And Job 37, 18 says, Hast thou with him spread out rakia, a solid dome, the sky, shacha, which is strong and as a molten looking glass? Technically, this verse being spoken by Elihu would not be a problem, but we'll add it here, add it here anyway. Shachach is an unusual word that appears 25, only 25 times in the Old Testament, mostly in Job and Psalms, and seems to be a synonym for rakia. It also used, it was also used for the clouds in Isaiah 45, 8. Finally, it is best related to De Deuteronomy 28, 23. And thy heavens that is over thy head shall be brass, and the earth that is under thee shall be iron. Literally? Figuratively, come on. This verse refers to drought, not solid, solid solidity, in the sense that the hardness of brass and iron represent the inflexibility of day after day with no rain or drought. Genesis 11:4, And they said, Go to, let us build up a city, build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. This verse was once popular amongst critics, but not much more anymore. Uh, they, they were loved to use that and throw out the Bible, but they're not poetic, poetic here. Really? Yes, they are. The words may reach are an insertion of the King James Version, just to interpret it. But sometimes your interpretation in order to translate makes you an editor, and you have to care for that. The reference is now recognized as meaning that the tower was to be dedicated unto heaven, not built to reach it. Of course, even if it did have the other meaning, it only reflects what men said at that time, not that they would write about were right about what they said. That's interesting. Let's look at Let it Genesis eleven four. Let me just take a look at Genesis eleven four and see what the seven versions do. This is what you should do. Genesis eleven four. By the way, this word search 12 has now been incorporated uh, by Logos. And so you can get all the, and very soon you can get all the, the uh, resources here, the word search Bible, especially the Bible knowledge of the, um, of the Greek interlinear and the Hebrew interlinear. They're wonderful. What did I say I was doing? Genesis 11.4. Let's look at Genesis 11.4 and all the versions. The only problem I have with this is this print is so small as my eyes get worse, I've got to get better glasses. Or, like this says, they said, come let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach. Oh, that's an insertion. Italics, see, into heaven, whose top into heaven. And let us make for ourselves a name, otherwise we will be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. So that's an insertion. Let's look at the Hebrew. And they said, come, we will build for us city and tower and its top in the heavens. See this? You have to insert something in the English. What does the YLT say? And they said, give us, give help. Let us build for ourselves a city and a tower and its head in the heavens. King James. Whose top is, there's an is there. It's not there. It's inserted to make the English sound sensible. Is in the heavens. Holman Standard, come build a city and a tower with its top in the sky. Actually, it should be in the heavens, what does it say? All right, say sky, heavens. I'd rather use the word in the heavens. Look up in the heavens, whose top may reach unto heaven. That's a little bit of an interpretive point of view that I wouldn't say. Authorized version. Back to 11.4. Let us build a city tower whose top may reach. They've got may reach there. Well, build a top with, that reaches to the heavens. Well, you reach to the sky. Say, I'm reaching up to the sky. Take a picture of me. That doesn't mean your hand actually touches the sky, wherever that is. Okay, so it's poetic, figurative. Really, really tall. 